This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University. And today I want to answer the question, is Bitcoin backed by energy? There's a lot of confusion after yesterday's video, which I will link to in the description notes below. It's called, should Bitcoin be backed by something? And in this video, I talk about why it's a very bad idea to back a crypto or a coin or a token with a real world physical commodity like gold, for example, because this leads to the same problems we had with the gold standard. You need someone to hold the gold, to store it, and to redeem it. And so this becomes an attack vector. But I got a lot of comments that were saying, well, Bitcoin is, is actually backed by energy. And the, there are comments like this, isn't Bitcoin technically backed by thermodynamic energy? Wrong. This is another comment. Wrong. Bitcoin is backed by the cost of electricity to mine the next Bitcoin. Like gold is backed by the diesel cost to mine the next ounce. Both are proofs of work. This is actually a very misleading statement that is uh, is not true. It's not backed by the cost of electricity to mine the next Bitcoin. We're going to talk about this later in the video. Bitcoin is backed by energy. So there are a lot of comments like this, and I want to address this because this is something that you often hear in the Bitcoin space. In traditional finance, if an asset is backed by something, it means that its price is somehow tied to that something or its value is being supported by that something that it is backed by. It also implies that the asset can at least theoretically be exchanged for that something. So for example, the ETF SPY, SPY is backed by the market value of all the S&P 500 stocks. It's an ETF and it tracks the S&P 500 index. So that's one example of backing, or at least theoretically, if you're a market maker or an institutional investor, you could take your SPY, take it to the company that does this, and exchange it for lots of little individual shares of the S&P 500 companies. Another example would be the US dollar used to be backed by gold. We talked about this yesterday. I thought this was a cool example, though, that I haven't shown in a while. Here's an example on the, the right side here. It says gold certificates were used as paper currency in the United States from 1882 to 1933. These certificates were freely convertible into gold coins. So this would be exa an example of a currency that actually is backed by gold because it's backed by gold coins. You can, uh, if you read this uh, closely, and I'll link to this in the description notes below, it says here, this certifies that there has been deposited in the United States, the treasury of the United States, $100 in gold coin re repayable to the bearer on demand. So this was not only backed by gold, this piece of paper, but it was also freely convertible into gold. This is no longer true. The U.S. currency, U.S. dollars are no longer backed by gold. This is from actually the Federal Reserve's website. Federal Reserve notes are not redeemable in gold, silver, or any other commodity. Federal Reserve notes, by which they mean U.S. dollars, have not been redeemable in gold since January 30th, 1934. This was shortly after uh, President Roosevelt confiscated all of Americans' gold in the land of the free and the home of the brave. If you're enjoying this video so far, and you want to support my mission of Bitcoin education, I just ask you to click that subscribe button, click the like button. It really, really does help out with the YouTube algorithm. So now we'll get to the question up for today. Is Bitcoin backed by energy? Now, certainly not in the traditional finance, the TradFi def definition of backed that we've been discussing so far. For example, there's no equivalent uh, place, for example, where you could take a certificate like this and exchange it for what's backing it. There's no centralized Bitcoin window like the centralized gold window that was at the US Treasury, where you could bring your Bitcoin or your, or your paper certificates and exchange it for energy or exchange it for gold in the case of the gold standard. Bitcoin, and you also hear this, Bitcoin is also not backed by processing power in the strict sense of being, of, of backing in the strict TradFi since there's not some underlying index of processing power that Bitcoin's value is derived from or that you can convert it into. I think it's more accurate to say that Bitcoin is secured by the processing power and electricity burned by the Bitcoin miners. And we're going to talk about exactly how that being secured works. So what exactly do Bitcoin miners do? Bitcoin miners or their mining pools bundle up potential Bitcoin transactions that are sitting in the mempool, that are sitting in the memory pool, and they put them into a proposed block. Of course, the Bitcoin blockchain is proposed is composed of a series of these blocks strung together, and they're tied together by their hashes. So Bitcoin miners then do some hashes, and I'll show you what that is in a minute, and try to win the right to produce that proposed 
block. And if they win that right, then they get paid 100 blocks later, they get paid 6.25 Bitcoin right now, plus transaction fees. Now doing, the, doing this hashing is lots and lots and lots of trial and error. They're not solving complex mathematical problems as you sometimes hear, they're actually just hashing. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. They need to do this trial, of error, trial and error and it cannot be faked. So proof of work is just what it sounds like, proof that you actually did the work. And the only way you could produce the output is by trying lots and lots of inputs because the output is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And the only way you can try lots and lots of inputs is by burning electricity. So here's an example of hashing. This is SHA-256, SHA-256, which is the hash function that the Bitcoin miners use for proof of work. You basically have some uh, data up here, you add what's called the nonce, you add a, an extra number, and then you hash it. And you wanna end up down here with the, in the output with a certain number of leading zeros. So then you can change the numbers here. Uh, you can adjust these numbers, make them go up or down, hash it again, and try to find a number that fits, uh, that has enough leading zeros. In other words, that's below the difficulty target, which we've talked about in other videos. But this is all mining is, it's hashing, and this is where the real job is. And it's a very, it's plug and play, it's trial and error. There's no way to end up, uh, to know what you're gonna end up with before you try the input and hash it. If you guess the right number that produces an output, as we said, with the correct number of leading zeros, in other words, it's below the difficulty target, and you are the first miner to do it, then you can send out your wrote your proposed block, and again, it's only a proposed block until it's been accepted, you can send out your proposed block to all the full nodes who check to make sure that all the transactions follow the rules, the rules of Bitcoin. And they also check to make sure that your SHA-256 input and output are correct. So they'll actually try the nonce that you've done. They'll hash it and make sure that there are enough leading zeros. This is part of what the nodes enforce. So Bitcoin miners, can only really do one thing. They can propose blocks, and in order to propose them, they need to essentially stamp them with a proof of work, proof that they did the work. If a block violates any of the Bitcoin rules, it will be rejected by the Bitcoin nodes, and it will, it will not be added to their individual versions of the Bitcoin blockchain. And again, there's no one version of the blockchain, at least theoretically, there are all these individual versions. And what Bitcoin is very good at is reaching consensus, reaching convergence of all of these individual versions. But there's no official version of the blockchain in the sense that it's stored somewhere in a vault in Wells Fargo, or it's determined by Janet Yellen at the treasury or something like this. So if a block violates any of the Bitcoin rules, it will be rejected by the nodes. And so Bitcoin miners really have only the power to propose a block and then they should follow the rules if they want to get paid and they don't want their block to get rejected. So how do Bitcoin miners help to secure, or if you want to use back in the sense of secure, how do Bitcoin miners help to secure Bitcoin? They create an order to transactions and blocks. They bundle up transactions into blocks, as we said, or into proposed blocks. They propose these blocks and they stamp them with proof of work to show that they've done a lot of hashing. This takes about 10 minutes on average to do all that hashing. And this is why we have Bitcoin block times of approximately 10 minutes. Good blocks, in other, word, in other words, blocks that follow the Bitcoin rules or are added by nodes to their versions of the blockchain, thus creating a certain order of the transactions in time. And this is one of the important things that Bitcoin miners do, is they help to set up uh, what some people call the time chain. I believe Satoshi called it the time chain instead of the blockchain. But there's a certain order that, to these transactions, to Bitcoin transactions, and that's very important if you don't wanna end up with double spends. So for example, an example of a double spend would be you send one Bitcoin to Belly, in block 23, then you should not be able to send that same Bitcoin to Sally in block 24. And this is one of the things that the, the nodes check. And if they see a conflict like this, they'll just completely reject the block. And the Bitcoin miner who, who produced it will have done all that work for nothing and burned all of that electricity. So if you try to include a transaction like this, a double spend transaction or another transaction that violates the Bitcoin rules, if you try to do this, or if it's a malicious or stupid miner packages up this transaction in a block, that block and hence that transaction will be rejected by the nodes. So what's a summary of this? 
Bitcoin miners help to secure the blockchain by making it time consuming and expensive to rewrite blocks in the blockchain and thus to rewrite significant portions of the blockchain. So the way this works, and Satoshi is very, very clever about this, is that the blocks are basically hashed together. So if we're currently on block 700,000 and you decide to rewrite block 699,950, your version, if you're a malicious miner and you, and you decide to do this, your version of the blockchain will only be accepted if you also it, uh, only be accepted if you also remine blocks 699, 951, all the way to the present, all the way down to 700,000 and beyond. And this is because the correct version of the blockchain, the one that nodes that the consensus rules say to accept, is the longest version. In, in other words, the version with the most proof of work embedded in it. While you're trying to remind those 50 blocks, all the way from 699, uh, 951, all the way up to 700,000, the Bitcoin network and the other miners, the non-malicious miners on the Bitcoin network, will keep cranking out a new block every 10 minutes on average, which means that you will essentially never be able to catch up. You might be able to do a four or five, six block reorg, as it said, 50 blocks is impossible because of you have to remine uh, each block based on its on its previous hash. And so there's no there's no shortcut. This is what you have to do if you want to be a, mal a malicious attacker on the Bitcoin network. So it's only in this sense that Bitcoin is backed or secured by a wall of energy. What we're trying to prevent is a malicious rewrite of the chain. And when the hash rate of the Bitcoin network is high, it becomes very difficult to fight it by securing lots of electricity and mining machines, ASICs, to do a malicious attack like this. So this is really how Bitcoin is secured or backed by energy. And it's really energy plus highly efficient hardware, these ASICs. Uh, if you want to do a double spend or create a lot of empty blocks, in other words, a hostile miner attack, you'll need to somehow get 51% or more of the hash rate and then waste a lot of money mining blocks that you will never get paid for. So there's no good economic reason to attack Bitcoin. This is only something that a nation state might be tempted to do in order to interrupt activity on the Bitcoin network. And if they try to do this and fail, all it does is show people how powerful Bitcoin is. So this is a very difficult thing to do. Bitcoin has never suffered a 51% attack. Various uh, fake forks of it, like BSV, for example, and various forks of Ethereum, like Ethereum uh, Classic, I believe, have been attacked, 51% attacked many times. And it's really Bitcoin's high hash rate that prevents something like this from being very easy. I would end by saying, do not fear the 51% attack. This is something uh, that's sort of entry level FUD, and it's not quite as scary as it seems. Again, it's never happened with Bitcoin either. In a 51% attack, rogue miners cannot change the consensus rules. Rogue miners cannot print up fake Bitcoin or force your node to accept more than the 21 million Bitcoin max supply. Rogue miners cannot steal your Bitcoin. Your Bitcoin is not only secured by a wall of energy and hash power from Bitcoin miners, it's also secured, we have to remember, by cryptography. And this is one reason these are called cryptocurrencies. Your private keys if generated randomly or impossible to guess. So your Bitcoin is also secured by being part of a private public key pair. Your Bitcoin is also secured by your self-sovereignty and your willingness to run a, your own node. So your node, your Bitcoin node, cannot be forced to run a rogue version of the Bitcoin software. If there is ever a 51% attack, you should just sit on your hands and do nothing and wait it out. And if you're a hodler, if you're hodling your Bitcoin for the next decade and the next century, as many of you are and as I am, this is not something that's hard to do because you spend most of the time just with your Bitcoin in cold storage. The only time you really do a transaction is when you send, uh, you buy some Bitcoin and send it into cold storage. But if there's ever a 51% attack, you can just sit on your hands, do nothing to wait it and wait it out. There'll definitely be reports on Twitter and everywhere else and on this YouTube channel. If we ever suffer a 51% attack, I will make a, a, a real-time video. 51% attacks are impossible to sustain. They will end after a while. If they were to go on too long, Bitcoin could do an emergency hard fork if there was consensus for this. And this would be something that the devs would do, the developers would do. They would not be able to do it without the consensus of the greater community. So they don't have unilateral, unilateral power to do this. They would not want to do it anyway because it would cause 
huge problems unless done in a complete emergency. So they could do an emergency hard fork and switch to a different hashing algorithm uh, algorithm than SHA-256, than this one that we, we, see, we see here. This would instantly brick and destroy all the Bitcoin mining machines, all the ASICs, and thus end the attack immediately. So you'd have these billions and billions of dollars of ASICs, which would be rendered completely worthless by this attack, because there's really no, no other cryptocurrency that has significant value and volume and liquidity like BTC. I, sp I suppose you could go mine uh, BCH or BSV in a case like this, but what would probably happen is they would they would collapse uh, along with Bitcoin. So this would this would be an, just an emergency measure that be, would be taken. Bitcoin BTC would survive, and whatever nation state just attack Bitcoin would look extremely stupid. This would actually create even a larger moat around Bitcoin. When someone tries to do something and fails, this really sets up a warning sign for other malicious actors that are thinking of doing the same thing. So during a 51% attack, just don't try to send or receive any transactions. And if your Bitcoin is sitting in cold storage, it will be fine. So if you're worried about 51% attack, what that really does involve is trying to remine an alternate chain. And it's very difficult to do it at an economic profit. It would just be a way to disrupt Bitcoin and the network and would not be able to be sustained for very long. Even if the government had the power and the electricity and the willpower to do this, as we said, a an emergency hard fork and a change of the hashing algorithm would put an end to it instantly. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you wanna be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.